and now we're live. There is still too much that some JKD people don't even know what and that they don't know. So today we'll ask the question, why is this and what can we do about it? Hello everyone, this is Dwight Woods, the Jikundo Rebel. Welcome to the I Love Jikundo broadcast number 236. This is the one about the Jikundo seminar effect. This is gonna be a long one. Um, usually I try to be on here for about 10 minutes or so. I, make, I might take twice as long with this one. So I'm gonna tell you that up front because uh, I know most of you probably don't make it past like the first three minutes or whatever. So I'm gonna tell you that I'm gonna, I'm gonna go into detail on this topic at the end. I will briefly mention a possible solution to it. I'll go into that more next Wednesday, but for some of you just know from the outset, this is gonna be pretty long. Um, I'm gonna try to show you something here, a uh, little um, inside baseball. So I usually, I'm old school. So I hand write, my uh my notes so this is literally the pages of notes for today's broadcast and then what i do is i'll make like um what they call them bullet points and then i'll kind of use the bullet points to remind me of what it is that i thought and 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 wrote out and uh and that's how i i i, I talk to to you guys All right so this is going to be long all right, so when, as you're logging in, um, say where you're logging in from, hit the like button and uh, feel free to continue doing so throughout the uh, broadcast. If you are catching the simulcast over on the YouTube, please be sure to like, uh, subscribe and uh, hit the notification bell. If you enjoy the program and you'd like to support it, please visit jkdrebel.com, click on the Rebel Gear link and that's where you'll see stuff like this, the JKD Notables uh, coffee mug, available also as t-shirt, um, long sleeve, short sleeve, sweatshirt, uh, hoodie, all that good stuff. But of course, the best thing you can do is to share this video and spread the word about the I Love Jikundo broadcasts. All right. So in those notes that I just showed you, I, I'll, I'll confess this. I started writing and I was probably two pages in. And then the thought occurred to me, you don't need any of this because that, and, but then I put it back in, which is why we're gonna go along. That first part was, was this. It, it, it's essentially a retelling of the birth of the seminar industry. Some of you might be aware of it, some of you might not be. So I thought I'd err on the side of caution as they say. So in 1967, when Bruce Lee um, started using the term Jeet Kune Do to describe and label his art, the, <clears throat> The dissemination of information was taking place to like a handful of students in um, LA Chinatown, right? The, the, the LA branch of the Jun Fan Gung Fu Institute. Um, the, the two other places where official Bruce Lee material was being taught would of course be Seattle and Oakland, right? Um, it said in some circles, those two locations weren't as up on the latest development. All right, in 1970 or thereabouts, Bruce Lee's focus changes to Hong Kong movies. And so the LA school had closed. And um, as Sifu Dan once said to me, the most dedicated students, they, th those are the people who had relocated to his backyard. Um, three years later, by the time of Bruce Lee's passing, that group and the equipment that they had amassed had kind of outgrown Sifu and Asano's backyard. And so in, um, I think it was April of 74, um, Sifu Dan and his business slash training partner, Richard Bustillo, they rented a warehouse in Torrance, named it the Jun Fan Gung Fu and Filipino Kali Academy and started teaching out of there. Um, within a few years of, of, of that start, that place, the, the reputation of that place had grown significantly. People started visiting, uh, many of them interested in learning more, of course, about Bruce Lee's art. Now, backtrack to the summer of 73 again um perhaps the most significant thing in in the in the martial art world was bruce lee's passing and this other significant event might have been a bit overshadowed by the death the unfortunate death of bruce lee what it is is uh there's a tai chi instructor marshall ho and he started a thing called the aspen academy uh, of martial arts 
featuring instruction in his art. And then I think it was uh, Howard Lee in uh, Choi Le Foot uh, Gung Fu and uh, Bob Dugan in um, Hua Rang Do and Roy uh, Kobayashi, I think, in Aikido, I think. I'm not sure that that was the exact roster, right? So quite possibly Aspen was the first multi-day, multi-week, um, multi-discipline, multi-instructor event. And with it, the martial arts seminar was born. In fact, if you, there's an article in uh, 19, uh, 1977 issue, I forget what month, 1977 issue of Black Belt Magazine about Aspen. And if you look at in the calendar calendar of events, so even though they're talking about this um, glorious seminar, this camp, in the calendar of events, everything is still about tournament, 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 tournament. Years later, if you looked in Inside Kung, uh, Kung Fu, in uh, Karate Illustrated, Black Belt, or whatever, the calendar of events, the, the tournament thing was replaced almost entirely by seminars, right? So um, Aspen, and you've heard me say this before, Aspen was followed by Jay D'Amato's uh, CMAA, California Martial Arts Academy, uh, UFC Irvine, 1981 or 82 was the, um, the, the first year. Um, long story short, CMAA uh, disbanded in 85 and 86, Vic Payne started Smoky Mountain, and I think Smoky Mountain ran for 10 years, and by that time, a lot of other th uh, uh, seminars and camps had started to form and come along, right? Okay, so now I want you to take your mind back a couple of a, a, a couple of decades more, because think about this. So now in seminar and camp, the setting is no longer that of a handful of students um, whom you saw on a regular and consistent basis. Now you're sta as instructor, seminar instructor, you're standing in a room with dozens of people looking for insights into the most enigmatic martial art uh, method in recent history. And the problem is, or, or is slash was, that Jeet Kune Do isn't really an art that's well suited for mass dissemination. Um, now, that does not mean that you cannot increase people's level of understanding or even increase people's level of appreciation for the art and its philosophies. It's just that the true cultivation of the art and the artist, let's just say it doesn't take place en masse, right? It, it has to be a little bit of a different setting. Um, doesn't mean that you cannot develop an effective system for teaching people the rudiments of Jeet Kune Do, right? Um, I'm just talking about the full measure of Jeet Kune Do as, um, as a vehicle for self-actualization, let's, let's call it, right? Um, okay, so. In the early days, these seminars and camps were attended by, you know, different types of people, but probably mostly by JKD fans, right? And, and these are people who are now ecstatic that there's a way to be on the receiving end of legitimate and authentic instruction from people who were actually there with Bruce Lee. And, um, and for, for, for many people, that was fine. That was perfect. But you know how some humans are, right? They always have to tinker with things. And so as the demand for seminars grew, it was realized that a limited number of people probably could not handle all the requests. So what to do? Well, one thing is to certify um, certain senior students as instructors and then allow them to start conducting their own seminars. So ultimately this um, permissioning led to the redesigning of an old ranking system so that an aspect of legitimacy is placed on the whole adventure. So that's the not so short history, right, of the seminar industry. There's more to it, right, of course, the, you know, the, because again, when humans get involved, there's always the distasteful aspects, um, but that's, that's, that's another topic for another time. Right. So more interesting question is what to teach. Right. So here's what a lot of us know. Sifu Dan never wanted to teach Jeet Kune Do um, on a commercial basis on seminar um, because, as we've heard, it was a, a promise to Bruce Lee to not commercialize the art, which is one way of describing the situation. Um, we've heard that uh, that he rationalized that the other Chinatown members 
or any of the subsequent uh, senior students slash second generation instructors, they had not made such a promise. So it was okay for them, right, to go uh, to, to, to publicly teach Jeet Kune Do. Um, my understanding is that Sifu Dan opted to teach in a way that could show the, the Jeet Kune Do principle of open-mindedness, right? And that could lead to the discovery of common principles, um, shared philosophies, maybe even similarity in technique, right? Across the board through, throughout um, different martial art disciplines. So what then is this JKD seminar effect uh, that I'm talking about? Okay, so simply put, um, two ways or two directions from which you can look at it, right? One is interconnected though. One is what's being taught and two, what's being done with what's being taught, right? So somebody may have had a different experience from me, but I cannot ever remember attending a JKD seminar where the material was broken down into beginner, intermediate, advanced, very advanced or whatever, right? Um, from what I remember, that that which was taught was whatever the instructor wanted to teach um was even in some instances what the instructor was working on at the time right some attendees like me were happy with this approach because i was interested in learning what was presented i, I didn't really care right how how it came but um as time passed and people started to log more hours of seminar training under their belt. You get it? <laughs> I'm so funny. And then the long distance instructorship program that was launched. It still seemed, in spite of all that, that there was seldom any instruction given as to what level of student could or would benefit from what level of material. It was still all thrown at you and, you know, do, do what you will with it. So there are people attending the seminars who were seasoned school owners, but maybe in a more traditional uh, um, martial art method. Um, and so therefore you've, you've been an instructor for a while, but you are a neophyte Jeet Kune Do instructor, right? Or there were people who had never been any type. So they were like fledgling. Uh, school owners or instruct or group leaders or whatever, whatever the situation. Um, so you're not being told what material belongs at what level. And so that's how you end up with, for example, you end up trying to teach trapping hands to somebody who can barely hold a baijong and kick and punch. But you had been introduced or um, you had been training the trapping hands at the seminar. So that's what you got. That's what you taught. Right. Um, furthermore, if you attended a seminar that was billed as a Jeet Kune Do seminar uh, by by the host, and then the material taught was like a smorgasbord of of different techniques from different arts, then you may have walked away with a misinterpretation of what had just happened, and you may have walked away thinking that that's considered uh, Jeet Kune Do, and you may never have been straightened out right um, on on this account. And then the original JKD versus JKD concepts uh, controversy came along. And so now people are able to say, man, I'm getting the real Bruce Lee stuff and not any interpretation of the Bruce Lee stuff. So in, in, in some arenas, right, because of this, there came a need to show who knew more than whom, right? who got the real stuff from Bruce Lee, um, who had forgotten more than whomever else had ever learned. Um, and so, you know, et cetera, et cetera, right? So in some instances, this led to new material being presented. Um, whether that new material was something that had been heretofore underemphasized or not emphasized at all, whether it was something that had fallen out of favor or even something that had been discarded as unimportant or irrelevant. But in an environment where people, some people must be and some people want to be informed and entertained, 
some of the seminar leaders might have been tempted to put out stuff that um, that might, um, for example, give a historical perspective, which is cool. But what's not cool is when there's no accompanying honesty about what it is that's being put out. And then people are left to interpret the value of what they're receiving. So it seems that much of the new superfluous material floating around the JKD world it arrived on the shores of the JKD world out of a desire to have more, which lets you put more into what you train or what you teach. And that's understandable because who doesn't like more or who doesn't like new? Raises an interesting dilemma uh, in my mind. My good friend, my good JKD friend, Richard Torres, is right when he says that a lot of problem solving in Jeet Kune Do can come from within. He's right. But he's wrong when he thinks that that automatically means the same thing as no outside influences um, on or outside influences in Jeet Kune Do. Okay. And just as wrong is anyone who adopts wholesale into Jeet Kune Do anything from an outside source without running it through what various people, including yours truly, call the Jeet Kune Do filter, or if you overlay it on what various people, including yours truly, call the Jeet Kune Do template. It, do, it, can, it does and can come from within but you've got to be running it through a filter. So, so it doesn't mean that, that that coming from within is only just the material that has been passed down classically, unchangingly from generation to generation. Okay, all right. So I'm calling for a return to the old school method, right? of breaking stuff down into levels while still applying the necessary and important JKD principles and guidelines, all right? But more on that next week, there'll be a solution, right? Okay, so what say you? Let me check and see uh, who, um, I was having a little bit of scrolling trouble with, um, with the internet. So I couldn't see who was here. All right, Russell, Terry Valor. Russell, I think you beat Terry. Uh, Tim, Tim, thanks again for having my back. Norman Taylor, you too, thanks for having my back. Uh, Jimmy Shakes was here, Hector Arvello. All right, Bucky Badass, Ramon Diaz, Michael Perez, Albert Kwan, Jeremiah Gill. Hey, Tom Macaluso, nice one. All right, Tim Red Tiger. <laughs> All right, the usual and Mark David Collins. Okay, cool. All the usual suspects. Uh, Randy Siordia, there you go. All right, so thanks for hanging out. Um, this is something that I will probably be talking about for um, a, a, a long time, a lot more time, because it's uh, it's it's getting um, it's getting a little bit out of hand. It's getting a little bit ridiculous, and people are starting to not understand what other people are are doing or saying, and so. Uh, I'm probably going to go on a crusade with this and clear it all up. All right. So you guys let me know what, what, uh, what you think um, about the points that I made. Um, anything you need me to answer, I will actually, that's, that's something that I'm, I'm going to be doing another um, Ask Me Anything uh, fairly, fairly soon. All right. So um, if you like what you heard, comment, rate, subscribe, hit the notification bell. Follow me on Twitter at Dwight Woods and on Instagram at Dwight D. Woods at um, paypal.me slash unified ma miami the jeet Kundo journey volume one still raw still un, still uh, edited right um and that's available over there um coming up on friday uh what's friday july 15th at um 6 p.m eastern time is um jerry winterfell another one of my uh, famous um uh, facebook jeet Kundo friends uh, Jerry is from Progressive Institute of Martial Arts in, uh, I'm going to have to ask him which is the correct pronunciation, right? 
I'm pretty sure it's Copenhagen for everybody, but I've heard people call it uh, Copenhagen. So Jerry's going to clear that up along with some other things for us, right? Today's a purple day, right? There you go. Okay, so that's it. Um, you guys, uh, I, I hope this um, resurgence of, of COVID nonsense is not going on where um, where you are. Thankfully for me, I live in Florida, you know, where uh, we, we're reckless. Ha, 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 ha. Anyhow, this is Dwight Woods, the Jeep Rebel, signing off. You guys take care. Talk soon.